Hi, my name is Kenny Eight. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Defeating Spiritual Adultery. Please turn with me to our scripture reading found in Joshua chapter 7, verse 2 through 5. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up from there, from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about thirty-six of the men and chased them before the gate as far as Shibarim and struck them at the descent, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. The battle of Ai is not a one-man battle. It's not just a two or three-man battle, but it's the whole body of Christ, the whole army of Jesus who needs to battle Ai. The battle of Ai is one that must be fought sometimes every single day. It is the first one that we will fight after Jericho, and we must win it if we want to succeed in our spiritual walk. If we want to collect the spoils, you must, I must, we must defeat AI. What is AI? AI is a type of spiritual battle that we all fight in one form, one level, or another. The battle of AI is adultery and idolatry equals spiritual adultery. Some may say, I don't have a problem with adultery. I want you to understand that when you make something an idol, whether it's your career, your money, whether it's video games, social media, even your family, even your ministry. Anything that takes the place of God is an idol. And an idol is spiritual adultery. Do not be deceived and do not deceive yourself into thinking that since you are saved, you have no more problem with such things. Because it's a lie. It's a lie from the enemy. Because the truth is, when you are saved, that is when the enemy attacks you even more so that he can conquer you and win you back. Look at Joshua chapter 4, verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. What is actually, or, or that, that place that they came up is actually on the west side of the river Jordan, but it is east of Jericho. Now, please understand that this is the Jewish New Year. It's their January. It's the first month of their religious year, which means Passover. On the 10th day of the first month, the Israelites were, or the Israelites crossed over the Jordan into Gilgal. That would be the day that they were supposed to select the lamb or the goat for the Passover sacrifice. And it would be slaughtered on the 14th day of that same month. I want you to watch this. This is a shadow of things to come. The 10th day of the first month, which can be thought of as the day of choosing, spiritually, because what was happening was that God was choosing these people. He was choosing them on that day, the 10th day of the month. And remember that the number 10 is the number of covenant. Also remember that these people who crossed over, their fathers were rejected because of unbelief because of disobedience, because of grumbling, because of murmuring. They were rejected and their bodies fell in the desert. 
the Bible tells us. So now God is choosing their descendants, these people, to enter the promised land. What he had promised them, their, promised their forefathers for several hundred years from the time of Abraham. He had promised that this land would be your land. It will be a land flowing with milk and honey. This is your inheritance. Then Paul likened the, the passing through the water to baptism into Moses. Listen to what Paul wrote the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 5. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that your fathers or our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness, meaning that they all died in the wilderness and did not enter the promised land. So those who were baptized coming up or coming through the Red Sea, they were all dead by now. So these new promised receivers had to be baptized. So they were baptized into Moses, or I guess into Joshua, but into Moses, the law, when they went through the, um, the Jordan. Now, I want you to see what happened next. They cross over and symbolically, right, that is baptism into Moses, into the law. Joshua chapter 5, verse 2 through 3. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Jabeth Haraloth. This word Jabeth Haraloth means the hill of the foreskins. Now take into consideration that in prophecy a hill or a mountain always represents places of worship. This act of circumcision was an act of worship to the Lord on this hill. An act of submission and acceptance of the covenant of God. So now they're all circumcised, which means they're now in covenant, in relationship with God. Let's think about this for a second then. This took a lot of faith because you have to realize that they were now on the other side of the, Jericho, of the Jordan. They were just outside of Jericho. They were in enemy territory. They were vulnerable because of the circumcision. But David later on, he wrote, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And this is what God was doing. He was preparing a table before them in the presence of their enemies. They could have been attacked by their enemies. I'm sure the enemy was looking out. They saw them encamped right there at Gilgal. They knew that they were on their way to Jericho. And they could have came, they could have attacked them in the night. And they could do nothing. They could not defend themselves because of the state that they were in. They would not be able to fight back. Just like the city of Shechem could not defend themselves against Simeon and against Levi, his brother, in Genesis chapter 34, verse 23 through 29. See, Simeon and Levi were annoyed. They were wet. They wanted to pay back Shechem for what they had done, for what he had done to their sister Dinah. He had raped her. And now he wanted to marry her. And so they went deceitfully and told them, if you circumcise yourself, then you can have my sister. We will marry with you and you'll marry with us. But they did it deceitfully because they knew that they would be incapacitated when they were circumcised. And they knew that they could not defend themselves. And Simeon and Levi single-handedly took out that whole city while they were hurting because of circumcision. 
Because apparently circumcision normally takes about seven to 10 days to heal in babies, but can take up to three weeks in older boys and in men. And some say that it can take up to two days before you can even walk properly, much less defend yourself. They, these people, they, they knew all of that. They knew the story of Shechem. Therefore, it took great faith to be that vulnerable in enemy territory. But the Lord prepares us a table in the presence of our enemies. They had put their faith in God and trusted that he would protect them. And they did. And he did. He protected those people. Think about all of that. Think about all the symbolism that's going on. Sometimes we just read the Bible for face value and we don't realize the reason why things are happening. And we miss the deeper and the hidden meaning why things are going on. What's going on? Why are they going on? And therefore, our faith is not built up because we read it superficially. Now, I want you to watch this. On the 14th day, they ate the Passover. And again, the Passover is a type of shadow of things to come. The Passover being a shadow or the picture of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So now they were saved, they were sanctified, and now they were ready for the enemy. But they got to pay the price. They had to release the tithe. They have to release that which belongs to God. Then they marched around Jericho 13 times and the walls fall down and the Israelites rush in and they have a huge victory despite the unsurmountable odds. They have a great victory. They were ecstatic. They were hyped up. They were high-fiving each other. They had a spiritual high going on. They were praising God, celebrating, praise the Lord. The impenetrable walls of Jericho had just fallen down and the enemy was unprepared for such an act as this. And they were defeated. The whole city was defeated except for Rachel and her family. Now they came to Ai, a little city with few people who were terrified of them. AI is always unassuming. The scriptures tells us that it's near Beth Avon. Now I want you to understand that this word Beth Avon. Beth Avon means place or house of deception or house of idolatry. It's a city near AI. It's always near AI. AI, idolatry and idolatry are always in close relationship with Beth Avon, the city of deception. Achan was deceived into taking some of those things that belonged to God. And he left a door open for the enemy to enter his life. And after being chosen, after being circumcised, after being in covenant, he left the door open. Same thing, after salvation, after sanctification, after being baptized. If you leave the door open, the enemy will come in. That's why God tells us, put on the full armor. And, and that's the other reason why God said, bring the full tithe. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that you might be in covenant with me, that I might protect you. That door that open door not only disrupted Achan's life and his family life, but the whole community. So much so that when it came to AI, the whole community failed. They failed at AI. Have you ever noticed that one of the first things people say is, it's my life. I can do whatever I want. It only affects me and it's my business. But in reality, it affects everyone around them. For instance, smoking. If you get cancer from smoking cigarettes, it's a family member that have to take you to your appointments when you get really sick. It's the family that will have to take care of you when you're at home. It's 
insurance that has to pay for all of that, which involves everybody uninsured who pays insurance. If they marry the wrong person against the family's warning or, or against the family's wishes, the stress still falls on the family when the whole thing blows up, when the whole thing falls apart. It's still the family that's involved. No man is an island. No man stands alone. We're all connected because that's the way that God created us to be. Paul said, a little leaven leavens the whole batch. And it's the same way with us as well. Just a little sin will mess up your whole life. When we leave an open door, such as taking the things that belong to God, we will stumble at AI. We lose the fight with adultery. We lose the fight with idolatry. We are deceived into thinking it is no big deal. We will lose. And sometimes we lose everything. We begin to make mammon our God. Take things for granted. Become ungrateful and unthankful. In life, we come into contact with AI right after we pass by Beth Even. You see, it all starts out really innocently. It's innocent enough. She glances your way. You pay her a little compliment. You start a little flirtatious conversation, not necessarily meaning that it will go anywhere. At least, not on a part of the woman. Man, you know, that might be a little different. Sometimes you gotta keep that man at a distance. You gotta keep him at arm's length the whole time because he can be lurking like a shark. He will interpret things completely opposite and turn it sexual real quick. That's a man. He's created for procreation. Next thing you know, thoughts begin to form in your mind. Then thoughts turn into imaginations and imaginations turn into actions and actions lead to death. That is why you have to be on your guard at all times. Because a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Please understand that the word poverty is a state or condition of lacking what is needed. It is below what is normal in society. See, when you lack what is needed, it renders you powerless, lacking the condition or the state to fight the good fight at AI. I'm talking about spiritual poverty. A lot of people suffer from spiritual poverty. Temptation is always deceptive. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now, ironically, Father West was Bethel, meaning house of God. Ai is always situated between Beth Avon, the house of deception, and Bethel, the house of God. Let me be really clear here though. God is in no way in relationship status with Ai or Beth Avon, but he isn't too far away to give you help or too far away to deliver us. It is like the proverbial good angel and bad devil on the shoulder. The little red devil with the horns and, and the pitchfork is always trying to deceive, always trying to get you into temptation, trying to get you to take the bait. And the little white angel is always warning you, trying to give you truth, trying to prevent you from being deceived. He's always trying to convince you that there's a God, there's consequences. Listen to this, idolatry is when one spouse cheats on the other spouse with someone else. Idolatry is the same exact thing, only it is not your spouse, but adultery against God himself. Scripture teaches us that we are the bride of Christ. When we commit idolatry, we are in essence, 
spiritually cheating on Christ. Think about that for a moment. Here's how it works. Adultery and idolatry are both deceptive. They will make you feel like you are in control, but you're not in control. It's like playing that death game. It's playing with death itself. The Russian roulette, roulette if you will. And not just any death, but it's spiritual death, which lasts forever. I saw a video the other day where this, this, this little dog and he'd, rah, 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 and he'd jump over the neighbor's fence and rah, 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 rah. and then the two big dogs would come up rah, rah, and they'd come bounding over to him and he would jump back over the fence and then the two of them would rush up and down the gate rah, 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 back and forth and he was just playing and they would go off again. He would jump over the fence and would start all over again. And that's how some people are with spiritual idolatry. They they're playing with death. That's what Aiken did. He played the Russian roulette game and he lost. He lost big. He lost his whole family. They all paid the price. Everything that he owned was swallowed up, was taken away. He got caught on the wrong side of the fence. AI always goes together. They are synonymous. Adultery is spiritual idolatry. And idolatry is spiritual adultery. As we saw earlier, they are interchangeable. God always likens idolatry to spiritual unfaithfulness to Him. I want you to look at this. God does not take kindly to idolatry. This is one of the things that really, really provokes and really, really annoys him out of this world. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 17, God says, You took the very jewels and gold and silver ornaments I had given you and made statues of men and worshipped them. This is adultery against me. He even gets more graphic in chapter 32. Let's read that chapter, Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 17 through 21. He says, And the Babylonians came to her in the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoring lust. And after she was defiled by them, she turned from them in disgust. When she carried on her whoring so openly and flaunted her nakedness, I turned in disgust from her, and I had turned in disgust from her sister. Yet she increased her whoring, remembering the days of her youth, when she played the whore in the land of Egypt and lasted after her lovers there, whose members were like those of donkeys and whose issue was like that of horses. Thus you long for the lewdness of your youth, when the Egyptians fondled your bosom and pressed your young breasts. God is upset. They have cheated on him. The Israelites have committed spiritual adultery against their God. I want us to recap. The Israelites have been selected. It was the first month, the 10th day, when they passed through the waters of, of the Jordan River, signifying baptism. They were just circumcised, signifying covenant relationship with God. They had just eaten the Passover meal, signifying Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. They had just experienced a very great victory, a great deliverance, a mighty move of God. But they left the door open in one area of their lives, and the enemy came slithering in. Every time it came to Ai, the Israelites fell, because Ai is hidden by beth Aven. Beth even the house of deception. And that is why the Holy Spirit said through Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 18, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, 
having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you have extinguished all the fiery, fiery darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and pray in all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplication. I want you to notice that all of our weapons are on the front side. Nothing for our rear side. The reason for that is simple. God does not expect us to turn tail and run. Yet when it comes to AI, he says, flee. Isn't that amazing? Makes you wonder at the very least what's going on. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, therefore, beloved, Flee idolatry. Flee idolatry. When it comes to these two things, adultery and idolatry, the scripture says to flee. The word flee means to disappear quickly without hesitation and avoid the encounter altogether. You don't even have to encounter it. Flee from it. Don't try to stand against it. Flee. In other words, do not take the second glance. Do not pursue the compromise conversation, but rather run away or escape the danger of entrapment. Disappear altogether and do not look back like Lot's wife did and turn into a pillar of salt. Just don't do it. We are to make a stand with everything else, yes. And even after we've done everything to stand, we're commanded, stand. Stand! But at AI, instead, we're instructed not to even engage the enemy, but rather we must flee. It's too deceptive. It's too slippery. Now notice this. The spies that Joshua sent out returned in high spirit saying, Oh, brothers, let not all the brothers go up. Don't let all the army um, have to toil up there. Just take a few of these guys. They are nothing. But isn't that how life is? It's the same way. Again, a young woman passes by shaking her thing and the heads turn. Oh, we're not looking to find, they say. We're just looking to see. There's a difference, you know. But Jesus said, even if you look at a woman with lust in your mind, lust in your heart. You've committed adultery already in your heart with her. It's the second look, it's the second glance that causes the problem. The world will ridicule you. It will make fun of you, it will poke fun at you if you stand for holiness. That is unacceptable these days. If you set up boundaries around your marriage, it's looked down on. You're looked at soft. Like riding in a car alone with a woman, if you're a man. The world is like Beth Avon, trying to deceive you, trying to trip you up, trying to make you fall at AI. But Bethel is there to encourage you. Bethel is the house of God. Before we go into the battle at AI, let's take a quick look at Beth Avon one more time. Beth Avon is a type of deceiver that lures you into AI. They are in relationship with each other. AI, Beth Avon. And incidentally, Joshua and his army coming from Jericho had to pass by Beth Avon before they got to AI and had to pass by AI before they reached Bethel. Beth Avon is a border town. In other words, it sits on the edge, hanging out in just the outskirts. It's a French dweller, which we walk too close, or when we walk too close to the, edge, to, to the edge, we slip, we fall, we get tripped up. 
and we fall right into, we tumble into Beth Haven, the seat, and then we fall into AI. AI, that adulterous and idolatrous city. As we said earlier, adultery is the same as spiritual idolatry, and idolatry is the same as spiritual adultery, and it comes in many, many forms. Fornication, sexual perversion, pornography, money, power, your job, your work, family, car, house, electronics, games, spiritual laziness, sport, celebrities, concert, TV, ministry, and the list goes on and on and on. When the men went up to fight Ai, they were deceived into thinking that they had it covered, not realizing that they had a breach in their armor. Let us put on the full armor of God so that in the day of adversity, we will be able to stand. The other important point to make in this is, when Joshua set the men up to fight, it never said he also set the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is very, very important. Well, how important is it, Brother Kenny? Well, it represents the person of Jesus, of God. It represents his presence. It represents all the promises God has ever made to us. It's a representation of who God is and what he wants for us, his blessings, his protection. It pointed to the fact that as the people of Israel set out to cross the Jordan to invade and to possess the land, they must do so not in their own strength. They're not to do it in their own strength, but in God's strength, for it was God himself who was going before them as their source of victory. But in the case of Ai, they wanted to fight that battle in their own strength. I tell you, if you do that, it's a losing battle. So what was the battle tactic that defeated Ai? Well, the first thing Joshua did was to seek the Lord. Therefore, that is the first thing we must do. When we run up against Ai, we must immediately flee. Then find a place of prayer and rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. Joshua chapter seven, verse six says, then Joshua tore his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. They submitted themselves to God. If indeed you have fallen at Ai, there is forgiveness for you. There is forgiveness in Jesus, even at Ai. The tear of the clothes was associated with mourning, grief, and loss. It is a sign of true repentance. The only thing is, now it is no longer rending our garments, but rather we rend our hearts and not our garments. Joel chapter 2 verse 13. Again, putting dust on the head is another sign of humility, great sorrow, and repentance. I want us to look at Joshua chapter 7, verse 13. This is God speaking. Get up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourself for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel. There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. God told Joshua to consecrate the people for tomorrow. Consecrate them today for tomorrow. You must always prepare today for tomorrow. If you wait for tomorrow, it will be too late. Tomorrow will come and it will pass you by. Jesus, is coming like a thief in the night. He's coming whether you're prepared or unprepared. Today is the day of repentance. Prepare now. Also notice this. He was not going to do it for them. The people were to consecrate their own selves. Consecrate yourselves, he says. 
Some people believe that it's an act taken by the Lord. But nowhere do I find the Lord doing this for us. We must do it ourselves. That is slackness to think that God's going to do everything for us. Even with the things, something like Mount Sinai, when God came down on the mountain in Exodus chapter 19, they had to consecrate both the mountain as well as themselves. God did not do it for them. We've gotten spiritually lazy and want God to do every single thing for us. We don't want to have to work at nothing. God will do it. We don't even want to witness anymore. Everybody's going to be saved. We don't even want to try to, to, to do what's right with our own salvation. It doesn't matter what you do. You're saved. Once saved, always saved. You don't have to worry about it. We're, we're like, take it away, Lord. Just take it away from me. But God told, told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul instructed us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, to get rid of the old leaven that we might be a new batch. We have to do it ourselves. We transform our own self by the renewing of our minds, Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And he wrote the same thing to the Ephesians. Let us read what he wrote to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self. He said, you got to do it. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupted through deceitful desires. Through what? Through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. you got to do it. you got to put on your new self. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Yes, yes, indeed, Jesus saves us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. But we must put on ourselves, our own self, by refreshing, renewing, refusing to think the way that we used to think, refusing to do the things that we used to do, by not participating in the things that we would have participated in if we were not saved. We make a stand. So whatever is false or wrong or evil or wicked, we must lay those things aside and we must cling to what is pure and what is right and what is holy and what is true and what is just. We must not think about anything else but these things because we must put them all into practice. And if we don't know what they are, how can we put them into practice? So think about these things. Here's how we defeat spiritual adultery. Joshua chapter 8, verse 12, verse 10 through 12. Joshua arose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. And all the fighting men were with him, went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai, where they ravine between them and Ai. He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush against Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. Notice with me, please, that Joshua arose early in the morning. When you are under attack, especially by spiritual adultery, you have to get up and labor in prayer. You have to get up early in the morning. It is not the time to slumber. It's not the time to sleep. But it is the time to get up. Because a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands, and bam! You will be overtaken by the enemy. You will be overrun by AI. Jesus got up early in the morning every single day of his earthly life to pray. King David rose early to pray. But not only them. Turn with me please to Psalm 119 verse 147. I rise before dawn and cry for help. He does what? Rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. The psalmist said before dawn he is up crying out for help 
He is not sleeping. He is not slumbering. No, he is a praying. He is a crying out to God. This is exactly what Joshua did when defeating Ai, which is spiritual adultery. Then Joshua gathered all the fighting men in verse, in verse 11, which is equivalent to gathering your prayer warriors around you and assaulting Ai, assaulting spiritual adultery, assaulting it and taking it down. Now, look at what he does next when he and his prayer team is assembled. He laid an ambush between Ai and Bethel. He erects a spiritual hedge of protection between the temptation and between the deceit, that his eyes may be open, that his spiritual eyes might see. God must always be involved with our spiritual battles, with our spiritual tactics. We cannot do it without him. He must always be involved. How do we get God involved in our spiritual battles? Get up early in the morning, seek his face, and call upon his name. Then the Israelite army fled from Ai. They ran away. We are always instructed to flee Ai. Always, 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 never a way to stand. So what the Israelite army did, it fled away from Ai pulling Ai out, drawing the men of the city out of the city. Once the way is cleared by fleeing, then God ambushes, he swoops in and destroys and burns Ai to the ground. You must have a brother's keeper, my friend. You must have someone that you can depend on, someone who will look out for you spiritually, someone that you can confide in, a confidant. Someone who will not talk your business. Men especially, they must have a brother's keeper. Someone that they can confide in. Someone with a judgment-free zone who will pray with you and not judge you. If you're that person, you must have closed lips. You cannot go talking your brother's business that you're privy to behind his back. That is just bad medicine. Just like any other spiritual battle, Judah must always go first. What is Judah, you ask? Well, Judah means praise. Praise must always go before a victory. Put on some praise and worship music. Enter into a time of worship. Flee Ai and God will deliver you from its grip. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and into his courts with praise. Stay away from beth Aven and keep on the side of Bethel. Stay away from the sea. Enter the house of God. For Jesus came to bear witness to the truth and to know the truth will set you free. Let me sum everything up. Spiritual adultery is when anything takes the place of God and consumes more of your time than that which you spend with the Lord. Here's how you defeat spiritual adultery. First, you come before God with a humble heart and a contrite spirit. If you're struggling with spiritual adultery, such as porn, pornography, or lust, you need to pray late into the night. You need to wake up early in the morning to seek the face of your God and to cry out to Him. You must include God because you cannot do it on your own. You must break the back of adultery, of idolatry, of sexual immorality. You will need your prayer warriors around you. Have a confidant that you can trust. Once God sees your mounted defense, when he sees your desperation, he will deliver you from the hands of the enemy. If you struggle with pornography, if you struggle with lust, I want to pray for you right now, right now. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I bring these men, these women who are struggling with lust, 
who struggle with pornography. And we come against that spirit of lust, that spirit of pornography. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus and we cast you out. We say depart now in the name of Jesus for the blood of Jesus is against you. The spirit of the Lord frees these people from your grip. Oh Lord God, release your spirit, release your love, your true love, pure love into these people. Right now in the name of Jesus, we lift them up. Build up that hedge of protection. Let them dwell in Bethel, oh Lord God. Let them dwell in the house of God, in your presence. Let them not be deceived any longer with Beth Aven. Let them not slip on Ai, but deliver them, Lord Jesus, that you might receive honor, you receive glory, in Jesus' name. Now I want to ask, have you ever received Jesus as Lord and Savior? If you haven't, I want to, I want you to invite you to come. Invite you to take Jesus as Lord and Savior. Here's how you do it. Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Help me to overcome AI. Help me not to be deceived at Beth Aven but help me to march past, flee AI, and rush to Bethel, rush to your presence. Protect me, O Lord. Build that hedge of protection around me that I might overcome in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and now this is what I want you to do. Get a Bible, a physical Bible. You need to read your Bible. You need to learn it. You need to highlight it. You need to memorize those verses so that you can know who your God is, what he expects of you. Know how he instructed you to fight the spiritual battles that will come up against you. It's there to encourage you, to teach you. Now the next thing, find a Bible-believing church, one with power. One that believes in right and wrong. One believes that, that, that we can cast out demonic spirit. That we can heal the sick. That that is given to us. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of your Lord. There will be with Jesus forever and ever. All your loved ones who have ac accepted Jesus all down through the years will be there a grand reunion. You'll meet all the believers that have ever lived. What a great time we will have in our Lord Jesus. I want to say that Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.